morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Church. Good to see you. So glad to have you with us in person. It's good to be back together. Uh, welcome to anyone who might be a guest, might be visiting with us this morning. It's great to have you here on this beautiful Lord's Day. A couple of announcements for you as we get started in our time of worship. Um, we are kicking off this week what we're calling the Wiggle Room, which is the equivalent of what some churches, I guess, call a cry room. But man, that just sounds like a place that nobody would ever want to go, right? Why would you ever want to go to a cry, a cry room? So we're calling ours the Wiggle Room. This is for families with small children who maybe the kids have a hard time sitting through an hour service. We totally get that. Uh, Lindsay Peak, our director of children and family ministries, will be hanging in the back, and um, she's going to help people find the wiggle room if they need it. Don't know if anybody in this service will need it. I mean, I don't know, Fred or Ian, if you guys need to wiggle around a little bit, you know, feel free to use the wiggle room. It's open for all. Um, next announcement, we have Faith Cafe to go that is still happening on Thursday nights. Don't forget about that. So we continue to provide a meal to anyone in our community who needs it. If you would like to get involved with that important ministry, Faith Cafe to go. All the details are on our website on the local missions page. And then one other announcement for you. If you have not been receiving weekly emails from us every Thursday night, then that means that either we do not have your correct email address on file or you have not subscribed to the weekly email. So if you'll go to our website, click on the about section, it'll drop down a menu and then you can click weekly email update. It'll pull up a little box. All you have to do is put in your name and your correct, accurate, current email address and you'll receive updates every week for us. It's really important that everyone does this because digital communication is the new normal for the foreseeable future. So if you haven't been getting our emails, please sign up for that just so we can keep you updated on all the things that are happening in the life of our church. Again, welcome to this time of worship. Why don't you stand and let's lift our voices to our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, 
give God praise. Let's keep singing. are awesome. You sound really good. You can have a seat. Well, good morning. At this stage each week, we, uh, we like to give back those many blessings that God has given to us. So we, we take time so that we can extend outwards, and that takes financial resources as well. So this is a time of giving. 
Uh, as many of you know, we now have uh, different ways of giving here at Faith. Uh, the easiest way, we think, for, for both you and for the church is actually to give uh, on our church website, which is faithrs.org. There's a button in the upper right corner for Give Now. So you can give a one-time gift or you can actually set up a recurring gift. Uh, there are also, if you would prefer, you can send a check to the church office. The mailing address is there at the bottom of the, web, of the uh, website. And then finally, there is a basket at the back of the, uh, the sanctuary if you'd like to give there as well. So as you know, as we, uh, each week as we go through our service, we also like to reach out and pray for uh, other countries of the world. And we do this because it's so important for us, again, to be outward reaching and outward focused in, in ministry and in and, and, uh, sharing the gospel. So this month, or this week, I'm sorry, we're going to pray for the Dominican Republic. Our, our neighbors down to the south. And many of us have been to the Dominican Republic, so this is a, a wonderful opportunity to, to pray for them. Uh, 10.2 million people uh, in the Dominican Republic with 930, little over 930,000 uh, evangelical Christians. Uh, some of the th ways that we can pray for them, they've had over 500 years of just turmoil there, political and economic turmoil. So we want to pray for, for stability and pray for their, um, really for, for some return to normalcy or, or beginning of normalcy, and maybe that can come out of the end of this, this current time. Uh, we also want to pray for them. Uh, they, they have in, in their worship, um, like many of the Caribbean islands, they actually have um, some non-gospel components, non-biblical components in their worship. So we want to pray that they would actually return to the true teaching in the Bible to, to true gospel worship. And then finally, uh, we do want to give thanks that they have had quite a, a growth in their evangelism there, that there are more and more uh, evangelicals that are there in the Dominican Republic, and, and we want to continue that. So if you would, bow your head and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today so grateful so joyful, so humbled, so humbled by what's going on in, in the world today. We come to you scared. We come to you with questions. We come to you, in many cases, with fear in our hearts. And, and Lord, at, at this time, we ask that you would calm us. We would ask that you would calm our hearts, that we would know your presence, that we would know your hand is, is on us. Lord, you, you work in many mysterious ways, and, and this time is clearly one of them. We don't know what's happening, but you do, and, and we turn our trust in you, great Heavenly Father. Lord, we also, we want to look outward, not just at ourselves and our own fears and our own needs, but Lord, we want to look at other brothers and sisters in the world, and so today we pray for our friends and our our. Christian brothers and sisters down in the Dominican Republic. Lord, we'd ask that you would give them blessings of stability, something that they have not seen in half a millennium. 500, more than 500 years, they have not had stability in their economy and in, in their culture and in their politics. And Lord, we would just ask that you would touch them, to guide them, to give their leaders the, the knowledge and the wisdom to, to begin a, a new chapter in, in their lives. And Lord, we would ask that you would bring their, their population back to your fold. Give them the comfort and, and the, the energy and the wherewithal to break away from what they've learned and start fresh, st start with gospel, solely the gospel in their hearts. Let them turn to the Bible. You've given us such a wonderful teaching and so, Lord, we would just ask that you would bring them back into a fully gospel-centered focus. Lord, we want to thank you for all those people who have given their evangelical skills and, and talents and wisdom and hearts to sharing your word. And we would ask that you would continue to bless them with those people, that you would multiply those people so that they too can, can come back to, to you to know that you are all that they need, that there's nothing else besides you, Heavenly Father. 
Lord, as we turn our attention back to our own country, our own state, our own city, our own congregation, Lord, I would just ask that you would bless our leaders, bless those people who are trying so hard to make sense of all the things that are going out there in the world that are trying to find ways to keep us all safe. Because we know, we know, Lord, that we will come out of this. We know that there will be another side. And that when, when we emerge from all of the, the struggles and the uncertainty and all the things that are happening in our, our day to day, we know that we need to be looking straight up to you, Lord. We know that we need to be focused on going and reaching out and sharing the, the good word that you've given to us. Lord, I would ask that you would keep the, the first responders, keep the medical professionals, keep the people that are putting themselves in harm's way safe. Bless those soldiers. Bless the people who are out there giving their lives for the benefit of others, that they have skills and things that you have given to them, Lord, to enable creation to be bettered. Lord, I would ask that you would be with our families, be with those who are worshiping from other places today that are coming here to be with you, but in new ways. Thank you for the technology that enables all of that, Lord. Thank you for just giving us this beautiful day. And so with all those things, Lord, we just want to reach our words up to you and these words that your son Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. have your Bible or your Bible app, will you take that and go with me to the book of Genesis? And we'll be looking at uh, a lot of what's contained in the early chapters of Genesis this morning, but let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 for now. And I'll throw these verses up on the screen for those of you who don't have a Bible or for those of you joining us from home. I want to read verses 27 and 28 of Genesis chapter 1 to get us started. And if you're willing and able, will you please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? We do this because we truly believe this is the Word of God to us. And we are hearing from our Creator uh, right now as we read these words. So Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. 
Today we're beginning a new series, Long Story Short. As a, as a dad, there are certain things that I hope to pass down to my children. Uh, I hope to pass down to them, to teach them about God, who God is and, and God's love for them. I hope to teach them about the spiritual disciplines, how to study the Bible, how to pray. Uh, I hope to teach them how to be a lifelong learner. And I hope to teach them the subtle art of a well-placed movie line. You must know how to insert a movie line into a conversation at any time. There's an ongoing sort of unending game we play in our house, and it goes like this. Anytime that someone wants to, without any notice at all, they can just say a movie reference, a movie line, and then the rest of the family rushes to try to guess the reference. So Jamie might say, muscle up, buttercup, and my boys would probably shout out, Moana, they would get the reference, exactly. Or, or maybe I would say, snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? And you would say, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Very good, you see this is sanctification happening right here. You're doing well. Uh, so we have this game that we play. And the reason we know those movie lines so well is because we have watched those movies dozens and dozens of times. And so what happens is the movie line, it reminds us of the overall story of the movie and the overall story of the movie brings a deeper meaning to the movie line. So here's an example of what I mean. If you've seen the movie Endgame, which is one of our favorites in our family, there's a line at the very beginning of the movie where Tony Stark, one of the main characters, he's having a conversation with his daughter. He's trying to get her to go to sleep at night and he's struggling as all parents do to get their children to go to sleep at night. And he says, I love you tons. And his daughter says, I love you 3,000. Now, those of us who have seen the movie know why that simple line is actually so important and so meaningful, because we know that at the end of the movie, at the end of the story, Tony will give his life to save his daughter, to save his family, to save all of humanity. And the last words he will speak to his daughter are those words, I love you 3,000. So you see the line, the movie line, it reminds us of the whole story of the movie and the whole story brings a deeper meaning to the movie line. What this series is all about is understanding how all the individual bits and pieces of the Bible actually form one great story. Most Christians, or many Christians, probably have no concept of this, I think. We tend to think of the Bible as this random collection. It's a collection of 66 documents written by roughly 30 authors over about 1,500 years. And we tend to think of the Bible as this collection of characters and accounts and commands, and we don't have a concept of the meta-narrative, the great story of Scripture that runs from Genesis to Revelation. And so that's what this series is all about. I have some lofty goals for this series. I hope in about six weeks to tell the story of the whole Bible. Now, last night at the dinner table, I announced that intention to my family and my youngest son, Cullen, said, ain't gonna happen. Maybe he's right, but we're gonna give it a shot. We could divide the, the story of the Bible into roughly six different sections or parts. Creation, rebellion, redemption initiated, redemption accomplished, redemption announced, and then finally new creation. So this is a story that runs from creation to new creation. And today we'll begin with the creation part. Now, we're gonna have to cover a lot of content. So for those of you who are note takers, grab your pen, your journal, get ready. Those of you viewing at home, maybe have a cup of coffee in each hand. We're gonna move quickly. So are you ready? Anybody need a stretch break or a wiggle break before we get rolling? You good to go? Give me a thumbs up. All right, let's go. Creation, here we go. We're gonna begin with the God of creation. The God of creation, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. At the very beginning of our story is God, and God reveals himself as a tri-unity, a fellowship of Father, Son, and Spirit. 
We see this in Genesis 1 combined with John 1. So in Genesis 1, we see God the Father is active. He's present and active in the work of creation at the very beginning. The Spirit of God is also present and active. And then we have an echo of this same language if we look at John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And as we continue reading in John's Gospel, it becomes clear that the Word is a reference to the Son, Jesus. So in the very beginning, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit present active creating. God is triune and God is eternal. Maybe you have always thought that in the Old Testament, God the Father was the main character. And then in the Gospels, God the Son, Jesus, is the main character. And then Acts and forward, it's all about God the Holy Spirit who comes to live within us. Maybe you've always thought that Jesus was, that his beginning was when he came to Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. He became the God-man in Bethlehem, but that was not his beginning. God the Father, Son, and Spirit. God is eternal. We also see in the beginning that God, this triune creator, he creates out of nothing. Theologians sometimes use this phrase, creatio ex nihilo. It's a Latin phrase that means out of nothing. Here's why it's important. If in the beginning there was something else that existed with God, some maverick molecule, then God is not truly sovereign or all-powerful over all of creation. But if it's true that in the beginning there was nothing but God himself, and from God came everything else, then God is in fact all-powerful over all things because he is the creator of all things. And that's what the Christian story teaches us, that God is all-powerful, and that means he's all-powerful over your life and over mine, and he has a good plan for us even when we don't fully understand it. So this triune creator, he creates out of nothing. Think of it like this. Most of you know Todd Runkle, one of our elders here at the church. If I give Todd a pile of wood, that brother can build just about anything. He can build anything. If I give my wife, Jamie, a canvas and some paint, she can paint a beautiful piece of art. We have these creative capacities because we were created by God, the creator. But there's a difference between the way God creates and the way we create. We must have materials. God created out of nothing. In the beginning, there was no pile of wood. There was no canvas, no paint. There was no material. There was God, and from God came all things. We see this in Genesis. Now, we must ask the question at this stage, why did God create? This eternal God, this triune God, why did he create in the first place? It's not because God was lonely. Perfect fellowship, perfect communion has existed within the Trinity from all eternity. So it's not that God was lonely. It's not that God needed something. Need is a creaturely word. Creation then was not an act of necessity. It was an act of charity, love. That's why God created. He loved his creation into existence. He loved you into existence. Let's talk more about that and think now about the community of creation the community of creation. Keep reading in Genesis with me. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. As God brings creation into existence, we see in Genesis 1 that creation is beautiful. There is beauty and there is order and purpose. We see light and darkness, sky, sea and land, sun, moon and stars, plants and trees, all the living creatures. Think of the beauty of it all. Think of the complexity of ecosystems, plants, animals, weather, landscapes, all working together to sustain life. God is the designer of all of that. 
creation is not just about beginnings. It's about order. It's about by his intricate design, God sustains life. Now, anytime we talk about the doctrine of creation, I always like to spend a few minutes talking about the compatibility of science and theology. The reason this particular subject, I'm so passionate about it, is because I think the church has done a disservice, not faith church, but the church as a whole, has done a disservice, especially to our young people, to students. Because what we have done is we have talked about the, the Christian doctrine of creation. We've talked about Genesis in such a way that we've led them to believe you must either accept the Bible or accept science. We present this picture that science teaches one thing and Christianity teaches another, and therefore you must accept one and reject the other. And so what we've seen happen, increasingly so in recent years, is students have said, fine, then I'll reject the Bible and I'll keep science. And what I want to say to you today is keep them both. Keep them both. Because good science and good theology are actually quite compatible. Well, let me give you just a, a couple of examples of this, and then I want to recommend a resource for those who are interested in this subject and want to study it further. I think Genesis is very clear that God is the triune creator and he created all things. I don't think that Genesis intends to teach us exactly how long it took God to create or exactly how he did it. Now you hear that and maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute, pastor, it tells us right here in Genesis, the first day, the second day, the third day. What do you mean that doesn't tell us how long it took? The issue is that our English word day is the Hebrew word yom. And yom has a wide semantic range. It's a fancy scholarly way of saying the word can mean different things. It can mean different things. So there are some Christians who believe that God created the world in six literal 24 hour days. And they tend to further conclude based on the genealogies of the Bible that the world is only six to 10,000 years old. We call these people young earth creationists. That's one way of reading Genesis, but listen, it's not the only way. And in my view, it's not the best way. This word yom can also refer to longer periods of time. So there are some Bible-believing Christians who say, there's no intention, the author has no intention of saying that it was six 24-hour days here. It could be any span of time. Who knows how long it took? Then there's even a third way of reading this. Some Bible-believing Christians would say, this does not teach us anything about time. This is actually a literary device that the author uses to communicate with us in terms that we can comprehend. And it's not telling us anything about the duration of the creative activity. All this to say, there are ways of reading Genesis as the Word of God, as the authoritative Word of God that has ample room for science, has ample room, for example, for the conclusion of scientists based on the fossil records that life is billions of years old, not thousands. So all that to say, don't reject the Bible, don't reject science either because they actually are quite compatible. They're friends, not foes. One Old Testament scholar says it really well. His name is John Walton. I agree with him 100% on this point. He says the Bible's claim is that whatever happened, God did it. So if there was a big bang, God lit the match. Whatever happened, God did it. He is the one responsible for our human existence and our human identity, regardless of the mechanisms or the time period. Now, we don't have time to get into this subject anymore, but if you're interested in this, or if you have someone in your life who's really struggling with this issue of faith and science, are they friends, are they foes, what are they? I highly recommend this book. It's a short book, it's very user-friendly. It's called Seven Days That Divide the World. Seven Days That Divide the World, The Beginning According to Genesis and Science. It's written by a man named John Lennox. Lennox is a professor of mathematics at Oxford, and he's a well-known speaker on this subject. I think you would really benefit from this book, so if you're interested in the subject, pick that up. Okay, we gotta keep moving because we still got a lot to cover. Let's talk about humanity 
in the image of God. We also read, skipping down to the end of Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This is human identity. This is what sets us apart from the rest of the community of creation. It's what makes us unique. We talked about this briefly a few weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 8, but it's worth coming back to again. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means that we were designed for a unique relationship with God, our Creator. We were designed to reflect His love to others. And we were designed to reflect His rule and His care for creation itself. The simplest way to put it is like this. In the ancient world, a king would construct an image in an area to remind the people of his presence, of the king's presence, so that the people would remember the king. Genesis is saying, you and I, we are the image. We are the image that is intended to direct everyone to the king of all kings, to God himself, the sovereign ruler of all. That's our role, that's our purpose. And that means that every single person matters and matters deeply, has profound significance because every person is created in the image of God. One more part of this, this part of the story that I want us to focus on today is the goal of creation. So we've talked about the God of creation, triune creator, the community of creation, and specifically our role within that. What about the goal of creation? One of the things we see in Genesis is that God's creation is not static. Creation is going somewhere, and we have an important part to play in that journey. Let's continue reading at the end of Genesis 1. God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Here we see our identity and our responsibility. The most important thing we can say about our identity, I've already said it, we're created in the image of God. But Genesis also teaches us that God created us male and and female. We must conclude then that gender and sexuality are part of God's good creation. God wired us for intimacy. God engineered the male and the female. He engineered us to create in the same way that He is the Creator. We must also say that this is not some secondary matter. This is a foundational point because we can't fulfill, we can't fully fulfill our God-given responsibility if we reject God's design for gender and sexuality. We see that in the next verse. What does God call humanity to do? God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. God says to the man and the woman, have lots of sex and rule the world. Whoever said Christianity isn't fun? That's the command here. We sometimes refer to this as the cultural mandate. The cultural mandate, the call of God to populate and cultivate. Populate the world, fill the world with image bearers. Fill the world with people who live in fellowship with God, who reflect His love, who care for His creation. The terms subdue and then later in the chapter dominion, these carry the idea of, of cultivation, of development. And so what that means is that Genesis is teaching us not only that every person is significant because we're created in the image of God, but every vocation, every career path, every job, that seeks to bring flourishing to creation, it is a holy calling. It is part of God's responsibility that he has given to us as his people. Here's the way one New Testament scholar puts it, Douglas Moo, he says it so well. The cultural mandate, this part of Genesis we're looking at, it challenges us to undertake study of the world and to come to know it as well as we can so that we might appropriately rule in it and serve our Creator well. 
In this light, science, art, and many other forms of work we sometimes label secular, they ought instead to be recognized as high and holy callings. If we are to care well for the earth, we need scientists to help us understand the thing for which we are called to care. And we need artists to help us see this world anew. And these are just a few examples. Scientists, artists, doctors, maybe even lawyers. Just kidding, that's a joke. All of us, whatever your calling is, if you can see in it how you are moving creation, cultivating creation, helping people and helping God's world flourish, then that is a holy calling. Listen to me, just as holy as mine. That's how significant it is. That's what we see in Genesis. Do you see how this story, the story of scripture, it's already beginning to restory your life. When you understand this big story and you find your place within it, do you see how it brings you a much deeper sense of significance? How it brings a much more meaningful, a deeper sense of significance to your family, your marriage, even your vocation. It changes everything. When we understand the good news of the great story, it changes everything about our present situations. So here's the story thus far. Let's summarize and then we'll close. The story thus far, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, He created all things. Whatever mechanisms He used and whatever the duration of His activity, God is responsible for the act of creation. He created out of nothing, thereby declaring His sovereignty, His power over all things. He thoughtfully ordered the community of creation, crafting the man and the woman in His image and giving us the task of populating and cultivating His world. We are designed to live in fellowship with our Creator, to demonstrate His love to others, and to make something of His world. The story of Scripture begins with the people of God living in the good place God designed for them to fulfill their unique purpose. That's long story short, part one. Next week, part two, same time, same channel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and help us in this series to see how it is in fact one great story, Genesis to Revelation. We thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself to us, our triune creator, our eternal God, our all-powerful God. And we thank you that you have created us in your image, and that means that we matter. We have such profound significance and purpose in this life. Help us, God, to see that this morning. I know that some of us have struggled at times, feeling like nobodies, feeling like we don't matter. Help us to feel in our hearts today how significant we truly are. Because God, you have created us in your image. You have a plan for us, a purpose for us, and we thank you for that. We thank you, God, for your word. Continue to teach us, continue to change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Thank you to those of you who joined us in person this morning. It was great to see you, and thank you to those uh, who joined us online as well. We're going to conclude our service like we do each week by reading together the Great Commission. Jesus is going to send us back out into the world with these words. So join me, will you? Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. You're dismissed.